All right, well, we're back with the fifth and final video in this series of videos on uh, systems of equations of linear type. In this final video, we're going to do some application problems. So we're going to see a few examples of some real-world problems which lead naturally to systems of equations uh, with multiple variables. So we're just going to look at several examples. So here's the first one. There are originally 255 foxes and 104 rabbits on a particular game reserve. The fox population grows at a rate of 33 foxes per year and the rabbits increase at a rate of 53 rabbits per year. Assuming these conditions continue, how long does it take for the number of rabbits to catch up with the number of foxes? How many of each type of animal are present at that time? Well, the growth rates are constant, so that makes these linear functions. And so if the for rabbits, the growth rate is 30, 53 per year, t is the number of years until they are going to be equal, and the original population is 104, or t is the time since, since we uh, uh, started, so since originally, whenever that was, whenever the original population started. So the number of rabbits then is 53t plus 104. Uh, the foxes, the growth rate of the slope is 33 per year for the foxes, t years, 255 originally, so the number of foxes, f, is 33t plus 255. Notice I use suggestive letters, r for rabbits, f for foxes, and identify what they, what they are. So that's two of my equations, and then the third one is that r must equal f because we want, we want them to, the rabbits to catch up. They start below but then they're growing at a faster rate, so eventually they will catch up. And so r equals f is my third equation. Notice I have three equations, three unknowns, so there's a good chance I might get a single solution to this. Uh, so if r equals f, substitute r, uh, f for r, and then substitute the expressions for each other. So ultimately we get down to 53t plus 104 equals 33t plus 255. That allows us to solve for t, as you can see here, by subtracting 33t from both sides and 104 from both sides of that equation and dividing by 20. And so that turns out to be 7.55 years. And then you plug that in the equation for either r or f, which you can actually see over here in the check in step 6. And we get 504.15 foxes and rabbits. So approximately 500, I should say 504 rabbits that. So approximately 504 rabbits and uh, that will happen in approximately 7.55 years. We can also see that graphically or could have solved it graphically by putting in the two equations that's blacked out there but that's supposed to say of course 33x plus 104 for the equation for the foxes and 30, uh, I'm sorry 53 x plus 1 over 4 for the rabbits, and then 33x plus 255 for the foxes. And then if you graph those, and this sort of window works here, um, initial time is 0. This is, uh, we don't know if the, this continued before this time or not, so we just start our time at that. Um, 12 years in the future is going to be plenty. Mark it off at one year at a time. Uh, but we need to, I started the, the y axis at 0, or the, yeah, the y scale at zero at the x-axis and then going up. And I know we've got to go up at least 255 or, and it's going to go up from there. So I went on up to about 700 and marked off in hundreds and graphed it. And it looks out pretty good because we can see the point of intersection. Then just do a calc intersect and you see you get 7.55 for the years and 504.5 for the number of, of animals, both foxes and rabbits. Next example, recall that under standard pressure conditions in the Fahrenheit scale, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the freezing point of water and 212 degrees Fahrenheit is the boiling point of water. Of course, that's pure water. In the Celsius scale, these values are 0 degrees Celsius for freezing and 100 degrees Celsius for boiling. Write a formula for the Celsius temperature, C, as a function of the Fahrenheit temperature, F, and then reverse it by writing F as a function of C. At what temperature do the two scales have the same numerical value? Well, um, the slope is, uh, you can see, computed there. 
delta F over delta C, which is 9 fifths, or 1.8, and that's degrees Fahrenheit per degree Celsius. So that's a constant each time, and that makes sense because we can interpret it as uh, for every time that you go up uh, 5 degrees Celsius, you go up 9 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, and that makes sense that these would have a linear type relationship. Or another way to say that is every time you go up 1 degree Celsius, you go up 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So the size of the, the degrees are 1.8 times as much on Fahrenheit as they are on Celsius. Uh, since we have the y-intercept, um, when c is 0, f is 32, we can easily write the slope-intercept form there for Fahrenheit in terms of... Uh, Actually, that one's they're backwards. There we go. Down here, Fahrenheit as a function of the Celsius is uh, not f equals nine fifths c plus thirty two. So I actually did the second one first, and then solve that same equation for c, and you get the same relationship, but solve for c, and so we write c as a function of f, so subtract 32 and then multiply by 5 ninths, so c is 5 ninths parentheses f minus 32. So of course you use the first one I have listed up there, c equals uh, 5 ninths f minus 32 if you know the Fahrenheit temperature and you want to find Celsius, and you use the first one we came up with, f equals 9 fifths c plus 32, if you know the Celsius temperature and want to find Fahrenheit. Now, at what temperature scales do the two have the same numerical value? So now we actually have a system of equations. You can take either one of these two original ones up here. They're really the same equation. One falls solve for F, one solve for C. And so that's our equation, F equals 9 fifths C plus 32. And then our second equation is that F equals C. Let's do solve by substitution. Substitute C in place of F. Subtract 9 fifths C from both sides and multiply both sides by negative 5 fourths, and we get C is negative 40. So C is negative 40 degrees Celsius, and of course C is also F, so F is also negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So they're the two uh, are the same when the temperature is negative 40 degrees. Um, both scales are the same. Another example. A milling company wants to mix alfalfa, which contains 20% protein, and wheat mids, which contain 15% protein. So that's a, a wheat byproduct there. And they want to use this to make some cattle feed. So the company wants to make 1,000 pounds of cattle feed, and the, they want it to have 17% protein. How many pounds of each ingredient should they use? Well, the proportion of protein is 0.2 for alfalfa, and A is the amount in pounds of alfalfa then you get 0.2a for the amount of protein of alfalfa. The wheat is 0.15 protein with w as the amount of, amount of wheat mids in, pro, in pounds, so you get 0.15 times w is the amount of protein in the um, wheat mids. The mixture we want has 0.17 is a proportion of protein. Notice that's just our percentage written in decimal form. We don't want to have 1,000 pounds, so if you multiply those together, that's 170 of the 1,000 pounds is protein. So you can notice that amounts do add up, so there's your two equations. Uh, and the amounts in pounds, A plus W equals 1,000, that's one equation. And the other equation is 0.2A plus 0.15W equals 170. Now we saw some qu equations like this before where we where we uh, use just one variable, but what we really were doing is taking that second equation and going ahead and solving it. So we had A plus W equals 1,000. If we solve for W, it's 1,000 minus A. And when we did a question like this in our earlier section, instead of writing W there, we would have written 1,000 minus A. But either way, that's what you're going to do. You're going to end up substituting it. And we get 0.2A plus 0.15 times 1,000 minus A is 170. Distribute. Combine like terms, subtract 150 from both sides, and then divide by 0 0.05 on both sides, and you get A is 400. W is 1,000 minus 400, so that's 600. So this company needs to mix 400 pounds of alfalfa with 600 pounds of wheat mids to get the proper mix. Notice that will be 0.2 of the 400 pounds is 80 pounds of protein from the alfalfa, 
0.15 of the 15% of the 600 pounds is 90 pounds of protein from the wheat, from the wheat bits. And that adds up to 170 as it's supposed to, so that checks. We got a bag of coins containing nickels, dimes, and quarters. There are a total of 21 coins in the bag. And the total amount of money in the bag is $3.35. Okay, this is actually... Let me change this. Not what I meant to say here. Let me try this just a little bit. I wanted to make this a little more interesting. Okay, here we go. Almost the same thing, just a little bit different. A bag of coins contains nickels, dimes, and quarters. There are a total of 21 coins in the bag, and the total amount of money in the bag is $3.35. How many of each type of coin could be in the bag? Now, if you notice, we're only, we've are only we got three unknowns, nickels, dimes, and quarters, but we really only have enough information for two equations. So, um, if that technically that would be infinitely many solutions. However, there are a finite amount of solutions here because number one, because the number of nickels, dimes, and quarters, all three must be a natural number. None of them can be negative, none of them can be part of a coin. So that will narrow it down. But we're not going to just get one answer. We may get multiple answers here. So we set some things up like this before. So the number of coins, I'm going to let N for nickels, D for dimes, Q for quarters. And the total number is 21 in the mix, in the bag. Uh, of course, nickels are 5 cents each, dimes are 10 cents each, and quarters are 25 cents each. So 5N is the value of the nickels, 10N is the value of the dimes, and 25Q is the value of the quarters. And the total value is 335 cents. And of course, our two equations are N plus D plus Q equals 21, and 5N plus 10D plus 25Q equals 335. And I solved this using a calculator. So I put this in uh, and did an RREF of the matrix 1, 1, 1, 21, 5, 10, 25, 335. And I got this matrix here, 1, 0, negative 3, negative 25, and 0, 1, 4, 46. So if I rewrite this in terms of the number of quarters, which was my third variable, the number of nickels is 3 times the quarters minus 25. And the number of dimes is negative 4 times the quarters plus 46. So I can select any legitimate value for Q, and this will produce values for N and D. So then what I did is I just went to a spreadsheet and worked out, or just do it by hand, and the quarters are an independent variable, and 9, 10, or 11 turn out to be the possibilities. So when the quarters are 9, 3 times 9 minus 25 is, is 2, and uh, negative 4 times 9 plus 46 is 10, and so forth. You get these other examples as well. If we go less than this, if we go 8 or less for quarters, then your number of nickels becomes negative, and that's not a possibility. And if our number of quarters goes beyond 11, gets bigger, then that makes the number of dimes negative. So that's not a possibility. So there are actually three different scenarios that might work. You could have two nickels, 10 dimes, and 9 quarters. 5 nickels, 6 dimes, and 10 quarters, or you could have 8 nickels, 2 dimes, and 11 quarters. All three of those are possible solutions. So those are the different possibilities. If you'll notice, in all those cases, uh, it's real easy to check there that those add up to 21 in each case. And since they satisfy these equations here, they should satisfy the total of money uh, correctly as well. Um, so you can check that out. Uh, let's just check some of them out real fast. 5 times 2 is so it's 10 cents in nickels, a dollar in dimes, and what do we have in quarters? We have uh, $2.25 in quarters. Okay? That works out to be $3.35. It does. And you can check the, I'll let you check the others. And you'll see that those are the only possibilities that we get. All right. Next example, we have a manufacturer of office supply, office furniture, and he makes three types of file cabinets. Two drawer file cabinet, a four drawer cabinet, and a horizontal cabinet. The manufacturing process is divided into three phases, assembly, painting, and finishing. He has different laborers for each of, each of those parts. 
A two-drawer two -drawer model takes three hours to assemble, one hour to paint, and one hour to finish. The four-drawer version takes five hours to assemble, 90 minutes to paint, two hours to finish. And the horizontal cabinet takes four hours to assemble, one hour to paint, three hours to finish. And he employs enough workers to have 500 uh, worker hours available of assembly line time, assembly time, 150 hours of work hours, worker hours of painting time, and 230 worker hours of finishing time per week. How many of each type of file cabinet should the manufacturer make in order to use all the worker hours available? Now, the first thing you might notice is we've got one thing that's in the wrong units. We've got one thing that says 90 minutes and everything else is in hours. So we're going to change 90 minutes to 1.5 hours. And then we're going to go forward from there. So if we let T be the number of two drawer cabinets, F be the number of four drawer cabinets, and V be the number of, uh, I mean H be the number of horizontal cabinets. So I was thinking vertical at the moment. H, I've used H throughout the rest here. So H is the number of horizontal cabinets. Then let's figure out how much assembly time we've got. We've got three hours per two drawer cabinet, so that's three times T hours spent on the two drawer cabinets. We got five times F hours spent on the four drawer cabinets and four times H spent on the uh, horizontal cabinets and add those together that gives you the amount of time spent on assembly and we have 500 hours available. If we use all of our time then that will equal, that sum will equal 500. Similarly the painting time is one hour per two drawer, one and a half hours per four drawer and one hour per horizontal. That adds up to the total hours of painting time which is 150 hours. Finishing time is 1T plus 2F plus 3H and that's going to equal 230. Well now we have our system of equations, three equations, three unknowns. There's some hope we might have a unique solution. And again I use the calculator method here to work out the uh, details of the solution. And by the way, that's going to be legitimate because uh, probably on the test, well, not probably, I'll let you know. On the test, um, the application problems will be where you have uh, calculators available. So you can use a calculator on a problem like this. You also need to be able to solve equations like this by hand, but not uh, in the context of the application problems. So um, let's see, what do we get? We get T is 60, F is 40, and H is 30, so they can make 60. If they make exactly 62 drawer cabinets, 44 drawer cabinets, and 30 horizontal cabinets, they will exactly use up all of their labor time, and they shouldn't have any uh, buddies sitting around it of, of any of the workers. Okay, a farmer has 1,300 acres on which to plant wheat, corn, and soybeans. The seed costs $6 per acre for wheat, $4 per acre for corn, and $5 per acre for soybeans. An acre of wheat requires five acre feet of water during the growing season, while an acre of corn requires two acre feet of water per acre, and soybeans require two acre feet of water per acre. The farmer has $6,150 to spend on seed, and he can count on 3,800 acre feet of water. How many acres of each crop should he plant in order to exactly use all of these, both his uh, seed money resources and his water resources? Um, this is enough like the last ones. I think you should be able to do this on your own. Why don't you work this one out and come back and check your answer when you get done. Press pause now. So if W is the number of acres planted in wheat, C is the number planted in corn, S is in soybeans, then the acres used are W plus C plus S, and that's going to be the 1,300. Uh, that's, by the way, that was the other thing that he has that's a constraint. He can only plant up to 1300 and we're going to assume he's going to plant them all. The seed cost is 6W plus 4C plus 5S and that's going to be 6150. Again, assuming he's using all the money on his seed. The water usage is going to be 5W plus 2C plus 2S equals 3800. Again, I use a um, calculator method here and got the results you see down below. Uh, I'm using an Inspire here, but you could just as easily do this on a TI-84. See the last video.
for how to do that. In order to exactly use all of his resources, the farmer should plant 400 acres of wheat, 750 acres of corn, and 150 acres of soybeans. So, finally, we come to the end of our series of lectures on systems of equations of linear type, or just systems of linear equations. So after studying this series of lectures, you should be able to do the following. Interpret the graphical meaning of systems of equations of linear type in two and three dimensions. Uh, two dimensions, they're going to be lines. Three dimensions, they're going to be planes. And what kind of intersections that we might get from those. Solve multidimensional systems of linear equations by elimination and by Gauss-Jordan elimination. And state the solution set, including uh, those that may be de dependent or inconsistent systems. So be able to tell if it's inconsistent so there's no solution. If it's dependent, we might get infinitely many solutions. Be able to state the solution set in those situations. And be able to check your work as well. And then finally, uh, be able to use, I didn't write this here, should said use your calculator to solve uh, Gauss-Jordan elimination. And then solve application problems which lead to systems of these types of equations.